Welcome to the NHL Wraparound Podcast, featuring Neil Smith, President, General Manager of the 1994 Stanley Cup champion New York Rangers, and longtime ESPN NHL veteran Vic Morin. Together, they share no-nonsense opinions on news and issues around the National Hockey League. Whether you're a casual or diehard fan, each episode of NHL Wraparound will leave you more informed. Now, here's your hosts, Neil and Vic. And welcome once again to another edition of NHL Wraparound. We're in the offseason. Neil, you like the shirt? That's. I wish. Tell me where you got it so I can make sure I avoid that store. It, it was a gift, but I figured, you know, nobody looks worse in this kind of attire than me, but it's the off season. <laughs> Everything goes. So as we start our off season, uh, we're going to be joined very shortly by Mike Santos from team 33. But first we're going to hear from Mike, right? From Howdy Hughes, from Bellevue to Bedard. We're your source for game worn jerseys. Go to migray.com. M E I G R A Y.com to start your collection today. Get real. Get it from iGray. And we're back uh, with our one-timers. And Vic, I'm sure your one-timer is going to be about your Hawaiian girlfriend. <laughs> well, not exactly, but we are talking female here. And a uh, big shout out to Jessica Campbell, who on Wednesday, July the 3rd, was named the first female assistant coach in NHL history. She's going to join Dan Bosma behind the Seattle bench, where she served with him as an assistant with the Kraken's AHL affiliate at Coachella Valley for the last couple of years. So congratulations to Jessica. Now, moving on, also want to make a point about the NHL calendar because, Neil, you know, you know that the finals took 17 days to play. And game seven of the final was just nine days ago on June 24th. So when you take how long it took to play the final and then what did last week's calendar look like? Game seven of the final on Monday, Hockey Hall of Fame announcements on Tuesday. Thursday was the NHL awards, followed by the draft Friday and Saturday. The Panthers hold their parade on Sunday and free agency opened on Monday, July 1st. So it just feels like the entire ca- calendar was just so crunched together. And it would be nice if perhaps there's a little bit of breathing time in there and maybe even start free agency on July 5th instead of July 1st. You couldn't be more right than to say that the the calendar was jammed together. The season and the playoffs went on too long. When I saw the final calendar come out and I saw June 24th, if there was a game seven, I thought, well, hopefully we won't get to that date. And we did. You got to think about the uh, hole that ta- that the Florida Panthers and the Edmonton Oilers are in as far as free agency goes and the draft. They don't have time to prepare the way the other 30 teams do. And I got to tell you, Vic, I was out at the NHL draft in in Las Vegas, talked to a lot of hockey people, and they tell me that the tampering with the uh, upcoming free agents, meaning this past week, uh, is just rampant in the league. That, uh, you know, there's ways to get around the tampering rules by – you know, talking to the agents through a third party or, or whatever you want to do. And the problem with there isn't a whistleblower in the league because everybody's doing it. So think of the hole that puts Ken Holland, who is no longer with the Oilers, but if he was the GM of the Oilers, that puts him and Bill Zito. Uh, from the Florida Panthers, the hole that that puts them in as far as preparing for the draft and preparing uh, for free agency. You can't tell me that all that plethora of players that were signed on July 1st, that they negotiated with and came to an agreement with and signed a contract with that team on that day. That just doesn't happen. So the NHL is going to have to clean this up somehow. How do you clean it up? I mean, if everybody's doing it and you've even got players that are attached to teams the morning of three or four hours before it hits noon Eastern time, 
you know where certain players are going. So you know that there is stuff absolutely going on well ahead of time. You know, the only thing that you might be able to do, and you'd have to do it through collective bargaining, is uh, say that when your team is eliminated from play, 30, you know, some number of days later, your contract expires so that therefore it's not tampering anymore. And the team that has the player has all season to work on them. Maybe you have an extra month or something like that. Like if a non-playoff team, you know, has it has a month. So they, they finish in the middle of April, they have the, till the middle of May, but then in the middle of May, the guy's a free agent. Now, there's a lot of problems there because there's a lot of teams still playing in the middle of May. They can't go negotiate and have time to do that. There's a problem with whatever we come up with, but the way it is right now, unless they don't really care, they're just turning a blind eye to tampering now. They didn't used to when I was in the league. Um, it, it is rampant and uh, they they have either got to do something or keep turning the other cheek. Who knows? Maybe opening up the negotiating window but maybe a week earlier, maybe uh, maybe that'll solve some of the problem. Who knows at this point, right? Absolutely. They got, I mean, better minds than mine are working on this. So uh, we'll see what they come up with. <laughs> or maybe not if they're turning the blind eye. <laughs> <laughs> it's my pleasure to bring back to NHL wraparound Mike Santos from Team 33, a man who has been relentless in making Team 33, a successful enterprise. And Mike, we want to talk to you about free agency and the insanity of July 1st. But first, let's look back at the trade deadline and the Florida Panthers, who ended up being Stanley Cup champions. You like what they did at the deadline. Yes. uh, It was one of those teams that we said we thought were winners, even though they didn't do a lot. Um, It's the way they did things. We both... we both know, Neil, that general managers have a have a tendency to overpay at the trade deadline, as they do on July first each year. And um, Florida, they really uh, they took a look themselves. They didn't have a lot of draft capital, and they understood that they had to act early. They probably were not going to be players in the Gensel sweepstakes, and so they made the move for what they thought was the next best thing in Tarasenko. And they, they took Tarasenko off the market before the other teams that were maybe suiting uh, Gensel got into the sweepstakes for Tarasenko. And he ended up being a key piece along with uh, another, another you know, small piece that they added, a veteran guy in Ocposo. And, uh, and those guys seem to be uh, you know, good ads. I know, you know going back to uh, 1994 forever, well, I mean, you you added some of those types of pieces at that time, right? When you add a guy like McTavish and guys like that, that are, are veteran guys that have been there before and that understand uh, how to help a team in more ways than uh, maybe just on the score sheet. If I can add one thing, Vic, before you 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 jump in, what I noticed in the final and particularly about Tarasenko was that Paul Maurice, I thought, did a masterful job of using Tarasenko's strengths and moving him around the lineup to get the most out of him. Because if you look at his production during the playoffs, he was more productive in the final, I think, than he was in the other rounds. But I think Paul Maurice had figured him out by then and how to use him. Would uh, I, I just thought that uh, he did a much better job finding Tarasenko the right fit than say the Rangers did last season when they had him at the, after the deadline. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, Neil. Um, you know, the games got heavier and, uh, and Maurice was able to find the right fit for him. I mean, they, they call him the tank for a reason. Right. And, um, and I think that as the games, as the games got more physical, as the games got heavier, right. As the stakes got higher, um, Maurice did do a massive job of putting him in the right place. So let's fast forward to July 1st, free agency. And the big headliner is uh, is the Nashville Predators. And so they go out and they basically pay $20.5 million per season, 16 years in total contracts to three players, Steven Stamkos, Jonathan Marcheseau, and Brady Shea. So you got a consmite there. You got three Stanley Cups there. 
and everybody in Nashville really loves it. Mike, you don't like it as much, though, do you? I think they better produce real quick. Um, they, I haven't done the numbers, but uh, by my estimation, they're the oldest team in the NHL right now. Um, they've got a lot of aging veterans. Granted, they've been you know even superstar caliber players in recent years, but they're aging veterans, and they've got term on their contracts, some of them for a lot of money. Uh, this is an organization that just got from under, by taking on money, uh, just got out from under Deshane and Johansson, and they're paying parts of those contracts still. And uh, last year, they went out and signed O'Reilly, who's going to be 34 this year, Nyquist, who's 35, Shen, who's 35, and then they just added, you know, three more, four if you caught count Wedgwood the goalie, four more guys in their 30s for term and uh, and a lot of money. It just, to me, it flies in the face of what Barry Trotz told us when he took over a year from now that they were going to get younger and take some swings in the draft at getting more skill. Um, so I hope it works out for them. They're all terrific players, but I think there's a lot of danger in what they did. I don't know what you guys think. Neil, when you look at these contracts, and certainly, you know, you, you had a lot of uh, signings in the late 90s uh, in New York. How often does it come into play that general managers are paying for what guys have done more than what they can actually bring to the team going forward? Well, I, I definitely think that was the case in the 90s. Mike was in the league when I was, and, and I think that you used to pay guys based upon their career up to that point, which was sort of backwards when you think about it. You should be paying people for what you project them to do going forward. I think it's much more that way today, but it's almost overcorrected because some of these young guys that they project, okay, I can give them an eight-year contract. And he'll still stay at that level or be better even by, you know, when this contract is expiring. And I don't know that that's always the case. Um, in fact, often it isn't the case. Um, they end up getting bought out uh, and it's big money that they got to buy them out or, or things. And the veterans, the guys that play in the last few years of their career, the last year, they're getting chump change compared to the kids who haven't done anything yet. And it wasn't that way in the past. It was the veterans that had done stuff who were going to contribute less now because they're aging and the kids got paid nothing and had to put some career stats together to start to get paid. So it's um, I think it's overcorrected. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that, Neil. I also think that you've got a guy like Barry Trotz, who I have a lot of respect for uh, as a hockey guy um, who He's only a year removed from being a coach. And I think the three of us would agree that coaches a lot of times don't trust the younger players and they tend to trust the veterans more. And, um, you know, maybe this is a sign that Barry hasn't quite made the complete transition to general manager yet. And he still has some thoughts a little bit like a coach. And that's, that's understandable. Um, but they added, you know, seven, 30, 30 year old and older to a lineup that already had stars that were 30 years and older. I mean, Roman Yossi's 34 years old. I mean, it's hard to believe that. It, it, he's a terrific player, but he's 34. Uh, Forsberg's 30 this year. Um, you know, Sissons is 31. And um, these contracts, if they don't work out, are going to be really hard to move, especially when you have that many of them. I want to shift over to Stamco's former team because they've made a lot of headlines as well. And that's the Tampa Bay Lightning. And, you know, I want to start with you on this one, that there's been a lot of talk about the way the entire Stamco's episode went down. They elected to sign or extend Victor Hedman for four years. He's only a year younger than Stamkos, but they let their captain, really the footprint of the organization, go. How do you read that piece of the equation in Tampa? 
I think Tampa this summer is one of the more interesting organizations to look at because they've hit that point where they've got to make some decisions, right? They've got choices to make now. They were a, a legitimate Stanley Cup contender for about a decade now, and they won some cups. And um, you look at some of the teams that have gone through this recently, and teams take different paths when they get to this point. You look at the Blackhawks, who went right to the end with Jonathan Taze and Patrick Kane, and um, and then just went rock bottom. And unfortunately, uh, did so in a year where they were able to get a Connor Bernard in the draft. Um, but look at uh, the LA Kings. They took a little bit more moderate approach. Um, they've kept some people around, uh, Kopitar. But in a sense, they've, they've made some of those tough decisions too uh, through the years with, you know, their the guy that was their captain and the guy that was their starting goalie when they, when they won those cups. Um, and then look at Pittsburgh. I mean, Pittsburgh's, Pittsburgh's in that middle ground and that's a dangerous place to be where you're, you're just making the playoffs or just missing the playoffs with aging superstars. It's a, you know, they're hard choices to make. I'm sure, I'm sure, uh, Julian Breesquad had a lot of sleepless nights, not only in the last week, but probably all year trying to decide what they're going to do with Stamkos. It looks to me like they made their decision that going forward, they had to choose between Stamkos and Hedman, and they chose Hedman. And they they signed the big defenseman. You know, they gave him a four-year deal for $32 million. I mean, that's not chump change. And and decided to to trade Sergeyev, a little bit of a surprising move. Um, And then... Went out and got Gensel um, and decided that they'd trade, you know, they'd trade five years uh, in age uh, with Sam Coulson. So, and a lot of, and a lot of, but, but so in the end game here, you know, and Neil, you know, I think, you know, Mike answered that question just in regards to Sam Coast versus Headman. The Lightning lose Stamkos, they lose Sergachev, Anthony Duclair signs with uh, the New York Islanders, and they also lose Tanner Janot. They add Gensel. They just signed Cam Atkinson, who was bought out by Philadelphia. They add Connor Geeky and J.J. Moser as part of the Sergachev deal. So then the question here for Tampa is, are they better or are they just different? I think... um what happened in the Steve, if I can read tea leaves uh, and not be in the offices of the Tampa Bay Lightning, I think that Steven Stamkos probably wanted to be really rewarded for the uh, being the captain of the Tampa Bay Lightning and delivering two Stanley Cups. And he was probably asking for something from his team that they didn't want to pay and maybe years that they didn't want to give up. And they calculated, well, we'll just let him walk. Now he couldn't get from, I don't think what he got in Nashville was what he was asking Tampa, but I don't know that. I just don't think it would be. And it reminds me of a very unfortunate period in my career when we couldn't get Mark Messier signed and he walked and got this mammoth deal uh, from Vancouver and uh, n- neither Mess nor the Rangers were better for it afterwards. So I- I'm not saying that's going to happen with Stamkos at all. But the feeling of losing a captain that's delivered not only one Stanley Cup, but two Stanley Cups, you know, I that's, m- m- you know, Mike, that's my guess of the tea leaves of what was going on there. Yeah, I, I think you're I think you're right on the money, Neil. And I remember even before that, I remember having lunch with you. After you won the cup in 94 and Messier and his father came in to renegotiate his contract. You remember that? And I remember you telling me I'd have an easier time doing this deal. If he came into me and said, I'm going to win the cup next year, as opposed to, I just delivered the cup last year. And that's the unfortunate part of being a GM. And, um, and you, you read it in my opinion, perfectly back then. Unfortunately, you've got to you've got to turn to the future, <laughs> and um, and I think that's what Tampa has done here. They they've just you know they've decided you know what are we going to do 
to make this transition? You know, can we can we do it and stay competitive and have a chance to win the cup? Do we have to, you know, throw it all down the tubes? I mean, they're they're picking their path. Um, and uh, you know, Gensel's going to score. He's just going to score in a different way, but he's going to score. He traded some years, and and I think the real the real choice that they decided on over the course of the year was we can't keep both uh, Hedman and Stamkos. So for the future, that's the guy we, we want to keep. And I think Vic, that is there any doubt Hedman will be the captain now? I I don't think there is. I, I think the most intriguing part here, though, is that that one timer that they had from both sides, from Kucherov, uh, one timing from the right wing circle, and Stamkos from the left wing circle, and you know the reality is is that Gensel's a left handed shot, and you would think, okay, maybe the most likely person to move into that that. Um, that left wing circle with the right hand shot would be Braden Point, but he's really not that type of player. I mean, he scores from in close, he scores in different ways. So, uh, certainly, I think some major changes on what that power play looks like as we head into 2024 25. But I want to keep this thing rolling here. Neil, this one's for you just in regards to, you know, you talk about change and new image and everything else. And we talked about Sergachev heading to Utah along with John Marino, who comes over from New Jersey. And this is a really built-up back line for Utah, who is technically an expansion team now. A lot of excitement there. They've got some good young forwards. And it's going to be very interesting now to see if this team can take the next step in a new location. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt that Ryan Smith will spend whatever he has to spend. He did, he's done that in the NBA, and I'm sure he's going to do it in the NHL. Um, the, the, the two good acquisitions. I think that their back line was their weaker part of their team this, this season. So they've really bolstered that with these two veteran guys. Um, you know, they were on the cusp of a wild card spot. With about a month and a half, two months to go in the season and then dropped out of it. And people said in, in Arizona that, uh, once the Utah rumor started, the team started to, to play poorly and that's how they dropped. I don't know if that's true or not, but I do think that, uh, Utah will be all year jockeying for a wild card spot in the playoffs. I, I agree. I yeah, agree. I think want to shift these. Mike, you want to add something there? I was just going to say that uh, when you look at Utah's team, they've got a very young core. And so they're adding some offense, certainly, to the blue line and Sergeyev and Marino. But they're also adding guys that fit right into that age group of that young core. I mean, you know, Keller and Schmaltz and guys like that. I mean, Marino's 27, Sergeyev's 26. I mean, they fit perfectly. Neil, you, you hit it on the head. The new owner now and the new location, they've got some money, which they haven't had for a long time. And, and, and they didn't go out and just go crazy in free agency. I think, they, I think they went out and picked up some pieces that fit with that core. I want to move to the East now. And a couple of teams that... Uh, one made the playoffs last year, the other didn't, and I think the moves are really intriguing. And I'm going to start with New Jersey because they had sought Jacob Markstrom because their goaltending was terrible last year, weren't able to get the deal done during the course of the regular season at the trade deadline. They're finally able to make the deal. They also acquire Brent Pesci, Brendan Dillon, Dougie Hamilton returns. They're going to be healthy up front. I think that also the distraction from McLeod and Calfoot sexual assault charges, that's all behind them. So this is a team that I believe is really going to be able to bounce back and make the playoffs this year. What do you think, Mike? This team probably, from what I see, had the best plan going into free agency. They really fortified their team from the goal out. They knew they needed goaltending. They went out again, acted a little bit early, and got Markstrom. Um, you know, he's he's getting up there in age. I mean, it's it's put up a shut up time for him. His numbers have always been good. He's always had a ton of potential. Um, 
this is his chance. This is his chance to hopefully be with a team that can, you know, can, can get near or, or at the top. Um, but they improved themselves from the goal out of Markstrom. And then all those defensemen that you, that you uh, just mentioned, whether it's Pesci or even uh, Kovacevic, who they got from Montreal. I mean, these are, these are big boys, right? They, they got some big boys back there and you know, big bodies. And, um, you know, they signed Dylan, like you said. Um, and then they got a, they got a talented young kid in Hughes back there. They got both Hughes, but, but, uh, Luke Hughes on defense, who these guys are going to help him in his own end. And that's where, like most rookie defensemen, right? That's, that's where they need, they need some help. Um, cause he can go. There's no doubt about it. But now he's going to have those big bodies back there to help him in his own end. I think. I think uh, Tommy Fitzgerald and Dan McKinnon, who does a great job as an assistant GM there, really had a plan uh, to fortify themselves from the goal out. And, you know, um, Vic, the one thing that we're not mentioning here uh, was the free ancient coach that they signed. Uh, Sheldon Keith comes in and he's going to be in his first year and he is going to want to prove once again that Toronto was wrong in firing him and that he actually is that guy that had those multiple hundred point seasons in Toronto. I mean, he's going to have a burning desire to uh, make sure that everybody knows he's a good coach. I predict that the New Jersey Devils will not only be a playoff team, uh, but they will be battling for first in the Metro Division. I just I I just think they're going to be that much better. I you have a tremendous season coming when everybody has an agenda, and I think that Keith has an agenda. I think that Hughes has an agenda. Being hurt last year, Dougie Hamilton has an agenda, and these free agents have an agenda. And Markstrom, who was a free agent, or sorry, who was traded there. They all got agendas, and and man, does do, when you put that all together, you're in for a terrific season. Yeah, and talk about packing the front of the net, Neil. Right? I mean, you've got a six four goalie and a couple of six five and six six D when Kovacevic and Dougie Hamilton and and Pesci. I mean, there's a lot of trees in front of that net for the puck to get to. <laughs> the other team that I want to talk about in the Atlantic that intrigues me the most are the Washington Capitals. And they've added Pierre-Luc Dubois, who I said a week ago, I'm not a big fan of. You know, he's in his ninth season. It's about time that he become more than a 20-goal scorer and more than a 60-goal man. Uh, they added uh, Andrew Maggiapani from Calgary. But also, on the back line, this is what really um, – Makes me think that they're on to something here. And a good job by Brian McClellan adding Matt Roy. They got Chikrin from Ottawa in a trade. And they also signed Logan Thompson. And combined with Charlie Lindgren, this is probably one of the better one-two tandems in the NHL. And, Neil, I want to start with you first, just in terms of what you see for Washington, because I'm not certain that they've really fortified their offense enough, and we still don't know what the long-term status is going to be for Nick Backstrom as Alex Ovechkin chases Gretzky down. So... Do you see the defensive and holding up enough to allow this offense to kind of grow a little bit, albeit, uh, you know, not with not with tremendous resource? They had a tremendous season last year with their uh, rookie coach. And again, let me repeat what I just said uh, about Keith. I mean, it was his first year. And he did a tremendous job. He took a non-playoff team. Let's face it. They made the playoffs with a non-playoff team. Spencer and, Carberry, uh, yes. Yes, Spencer Carberry did a fantastic job. Now, year two, it's harder because the players know you, uh, you know, and, and it's just, it just gets harder. It, 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 it doesn't mean he's not a good coach. He is a good coach, but it's going to get harder. Um, I'm not sure whether the Capitals are just trying to keep going for Alexander Ovechkin or for um, their owner uh, or why they're, you know, doing it the way they're doing it, but they're certainly not rebuilding. So somebody has been told, uh, don't worry, we're not going to try to rebuild. It has to be because um, they're, they're sort of going the Pittsburgh route, trying to, I don't know, stay alive and, and grasping at straws, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Mike, how do you see it? Uh, real interesting. I mean, 
all of those guys, you know, Manja Pandi is a different type of player. I'm, you know, I see him on the lower lines, but whether it's Pierre Luc Dubois, whether it's Chikrin, especially those two, I mean, what player are they getting, right? I mean, we're going to find out is, is Chikrin really the, you know, the all star defenseman that everybody thought he was when he was drafted, or is he just going to be a good, you know, number four? Um, is Pierre Luc Dubois going to get back the, you know, the, uh, the offensive, uh, touch and ability that he was showing before he, he ended up in LA? Or, uh, is he going to just stay there on that same road? Um, really, uh, I don't want to say risky, but, uh, you know, but they're, they're good players, but, um, but they could, they could reap big rewards, particularly with Chicklin and, and Dubois. Um, I thought the Thompson move was a great move. I mean, I mean, everything in this league starts with goaltending, and they went out and got a good one. Want to head north of the border now and talk about a couple of clubs that uh, always the expectations are big. I'm going to start off with the Toronto Maple Leafs and uh, Brad Trevling certainly. Um, looking to strengthen up that back line uh, in order to complement the big four up front. So they add Chris Tanev, uh, Oliver Eggman Larson, and Anthony Stolarz in goal from Florida. They re-sign um, um, Max Domi and, and uh, Matt Murray in goal. So at least on paper, this team looks different and it looks better. Mike? Yeah, last year, I, you know, Brad Treliving came in, you know, right right before this time, and uh, I don't know they were they were uh, obsessed with toughness for some reason. <laughs> um, this year, I think they've done a little bit better. I mean, seems like they lost a lot of Florida, you know, going after Oliver Ekman Larson. Sure, um, you know, I like I like the doming resigning. <laughs> Um, but I think until they move or uh, decide on that guy up front and what they're going to do with them, they're really not going to know what direction these guys are going in. Neil, how much of this also, because Mike, you know, made, you know, a good point of what traveling had to do in his first year. How much of that was cleaning up Kyle Dubas's mess? Oh, I think there's, there is some cleaning up that, was done there by tree living. I don't think that uh, he got left a, a, a Stanley cup team or a team that was, let's say, well put together. Doesn't mean that Dubas is at fault for all of them because they, a lot of these guys he took in the draft when they were there, they were available. You don't turn down a great player just because you have too many. So, um, but they got to decide what they're doing with Marner and, you know, Toronto is crazy how they are, are so fixated on, uh, they should trade Marner. They should trade Marner. And Tr Marner's a Toronto kid. Like he doesn't want to get traded out of Toronto. So that'll be interesting to see how they handle that. I think that Tanev was a, a great thing. Now, Tanev, don't forget, uh, played for Tree Living in Calgary. So that's how they know each other. So the fix was in there. Oliver Ekman Larson, I think, had a rebirth in Florida. Um, I never saw him play that well that he, that he did in the, in, going into the Stanley Cup. Uh, Stolarz is certainly a very capable guy to be behind wall and, I know they signed Matt Murray for low money and just as a third guy. So you're, you're going to see Matt Murray after winning two Stanley Cups, uh, back to back with Pittsburgh as the number one goalie. He's probably going to be the number one goalie on the Toronto Marlies next season because he's going to be number three in Toronto. And, um, I, you know, Max Domi in my mind, and I watch Max a lot because of my relationship with Ty finally found a home uh, he's gone so many years now after the arizona thing he he got to montreal and then they moved him off and he ended up in columbus he got to dallas he went to here there and too many teams to almost mention finally he signs back in toronto um interesting point mike and vic is that when he signed i i text ty and i said is he going to wear 28 and he said, no, he wants to be his own guy. Uh, that's interesting, you know, because it would be a natural that you would think like father, like son, but 
He wanted to be his own guy. And I thought he had a hell of a year for the Toronto Maple Leafs and, and uh, was very, very effective for them. I want to hit on the Edmonton Oilers just very briefly. Um, not sure that they're any closer to winning the Stanley Cup now than they were uh, 10 days ago, but they do add Jeff Skinner, who's the first player in NHL history to play over a thousand games and not make the playoffs. I'm kind of liking his odds for 20, 24, 25. Uh, they uh, added Arvidsson, uh, Josh Brown, and they lose, uh, and they lose Fogel. So, Mike, from where you're sitting here, is this team any better or are these just kind of filler pieces uh, as this uh, team starts to go forward? I think they just move the furniture around a little bit. I mean, you know, they re-signed uh, Jan Mark, uh, Perry, Henrique. Um, I like the – it's a low-risk move on Skinner, I think, for one year. I mean, he could pay big dividends, so I, I – I'm I'm good with that for sure. Arvidsson, a little more risky. They gave him two years, four million a year. He's a small guy, had injury problems last year. Um, you know, I think that's a little more risky. But overall, do they do much to change their team? No, I mean they're you know they're going to rely on two guys like they did this year, right? And and I think we saw. You know, in that seven-game series with Florida for the final, um, particularly that third period, uh, McDavid was just out of gas. He, he just had no more to give. I mean, don't don't forget this. This wasn't just a seven-game series that he that he was leading the charge. It was a it was an eighty-two regular season, <laughs> eighty-two game regular season that he had to lead the charge for them. And then you know, four rounds of the playoffs. And coming back from a three zero, um, so they're gonna they're gonna put a lot of uh, a lot of their faith into into uh, McDavid and Drysaitel. Neil Leon Drysaitel will be a UFA after next season. How do you see this playing out? <sighs> from what I'm hearing, he's waiting for. You know, for the taxi to pull up and and go somewhere else. Um, you know, that's what I hear. That's not what I know because I don't know him. But if you again try to read tea leaves, and he's a German national, he's not Canadian. Um, you know, he can. I, I'm sure that coming from Germany, he would love to play in a big American city rather than a small. Canadian city. Um, and it's going to be hard for Edmonton to keep him. I think that that's just what I think. I love the Skinner signing. That's a no risk situation for them. If they can get out of him a little bit of the Carolina that he, what he showed in Carolina, they're going to have something really, uh, again, another offensive weapon. Not that that's what they necessarily need, but I like when you do things like Kenny Holland did a few of them before he left. He, he picked up Evander Kane. Uh, Corey Perry was a good ad at the time that they did it. Um, he's taken some reclamation projects and they've really turned out. Now, unfortunately, as much as he hit a grand slam on Hyman, you know, he struck out and was, uh, <laughs> and was suspended from the league for Jack Campbell. So, um, you know, he, uh, but overall, Kenny did a great job in Edmonton. A and getting back to your original question, you know, Leon Dreisaitl will already knows right now what he's going to do. Will he stay with Connor? Cause he just wants to have a career with Connor. Maybe. I mean, they sure look on the ice like they're buddies and, uh, who knows? Last couple of teams that we're going to hit, really, just in terms of specifics. Boston and Vancouver uh, literally have swapped a lot of players. So let's go through the laundry list first. The Bruins, they they add Lindholm and Nikita Zadorov from the Canucks. They lose Jake DeBrus to Vancouver. 
Danton Heinen to Vancouver, Derek Forbert to Vancouver, uh, and also Matt Grizzlick winds up signing uh, with Pittsburgh and Pat Maroon with the Chicago Blackhawks. So just, Mike, just very interesting that uh, Boston and Vancouver just literally swap players in here through free agency. Yeah, this is trading places, right? The, the, the title of this episode, I mean, that's pretty much what happened here. It's pretty interesting, um, especially since they're, uh, they're on uh, opposite sides of the continent, too. But uh, obviously, those teams were watching one another. Um, I mean, DeBrusque, for whatever reason, he just never was a fit for Boston. Um, the whole time they drafted him in the middle of the first round, um, they never really showed him any love. And, um, and he never really gave him a lot of chances to show him love either. So um, I think that was a foregone conclusion that he was going to go. Um, he's from Western Canada. I think he's from the Edmonton area, but, um, you know, Vancouver is a pretty nice place to go if you're a Western Canadian. So I can see that coming. Um, Grizzlick, I think, uh, you know, he had his time. You know, his father worked on the bull gang at, in the garden and uh, local kid. Um, but he, he had, I think he was just too small to play um, the way they want to play. And uh, or the way that fans want them to play, so probably a good move for him out too. But I do like I do like the pieces that Boston picked up. I think Lindholm's going to really help them. They had some they had some problems this year at forward, uh, and uh, particularly in the middle. And um, and Zadorov's going to give them that big deep that that they like. Um, I know he, he can't use the moniker uh, Big Z. That's already been been told to him. So, uh, but he is kind of like Chara 2.0, though, yeah. in terms of size. Yeah, he is, and, and that's uh, that's that's what they want. So, I think uh, you know, for uh, for Vancouver, got some nice players, um, but they're 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 all about the future. I mean, they got a they got a 22 year old Norris Trophy winner, and a and a you know a young team that's on the move up for the, for the coach who did a great job this year. Um, so. I don't think they needed to land anything. Maybe this is a, the right home for DeBrusque, and he'll fit into that lineup nicely. Um, I think they're fine. Let me make Neil, a couple. Do you see either of those two teams closer to cup contenders now? <sighs> you know, I, I, I don't know about cup contenders. Um, I like the future for Vancouver, whether it's this year or in a couple of years. Uh, it's hard to tell. Will they keep taking another step forward? But let me make a couple of comments on the Boston acquisitions. Uh, do Zadorov and Lindholm live together? Because they go from Calgary to Vancouver, and now they're together in Boston. That, that's just the one comment. On Jake DeBrusque, I traded his father for Mark Messier. I, I, I don't know if that's where Jake was born. Uh, I don't know. Do you know, uh, uh, Mike, what year uh, DeBrusque is born? Um, well, he was drafted 2014. So he's 28. So 28. So 10 years 96. ago. 96. He would have been in 96. Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, that's so. So you, you, I'm the reason he was born in Edmonton. I was going to say you, uh, you made it. Yeah, ninety six, October seventeenth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't don't tell Louis that I said that I'm the reason because uh, Louis is a tough guy and I love Louis. He's a great guy. But anyway, um, uh, you, you know, I, I am. Uh, I think that Boston did improve themselves. I like the Pat Maroon signing. And Pat Maroon goes into Chicago and replaces Corey Perry in a lot of different ways, right? He's a guy with Stanley Cups that can show Bedard and uh, this year's first overall pick, or second overall pick, I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, he can show them the way and, and be good to them and stand up for people. Um, the, you know, the way that, um, they need for those young guys and smaller guys. So I, I, th that's going to be a signing that's sort of going to go under the radar, but I think it was a good pickup for Chicago. Last part of this segment, 60 seconds for each of you. Mike, I'm going to start with you. 
Any other teams that we have not mentioned, because we can't cover all 32, but we've hit about 10 of them. Uh, any other teams that have intrigued you with their movement or their, quite frankly, lack of it to this point? Um, I would have said Anaheim, although they added uh, to Moulin now. Um, but, um, but no, I, 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 don't, I don't think so. I think that, you know, you go into the trade deadline every year, and there are teams that just know beforehand that it's just too expensive and, and they're not going to change their plans. And I think Anaheim's one of those teams. They're not going to change their plans to go chasing after free agents. They, they, you know, they're going to, they're going to draft, they're going to develop and they're going to make decisions and, uh, and stick to the plan. So I don't, I don't think there's any, any real surprises other than the teams we already talked about. Yeah, what about your eyebrows? Raised or not raised by any clubs here? Yeah, it, they were raised by the um, Vegas Golden Knights because they are so aggressive um, all the time, every year. And when they didn't do anything, I was I was surprised because even though they got, I know they're, the cap space and all those issues that are in there, but they always seem to find a way. And, um, you know, I, I they were strangely silent during the free agent thing. So that's the one that surprised me. All right. Well, that wraps up this part of the segment. But when we come back, Mike will still be with us. And we're going to talk taxes or tax-free, <laughs> tax-free states. But first, uh, we're going to hear from Mike Gray. Time now for a quick shout out to our sponsor. NHL Wraparound is brought to you by MyGray, your source for game worn jerseys. Head to MyGray.com to get your collection started today. Get real, get it from MyGray. NHL Wraparound subscribers can take 10% off any hockey jersey when they order at MyGray.com and use the coupon code RAP10. Don't forget that coupon code WRAP10. Welcome back to Wraparound. Remember, our website is NHLWraparound.com. And we are back with Mike Santos, the founder of Team 33, an independent scouting service. And he's also the former assistant general manager for the New York Islanders, Florida Panthers, and Nashville Predators. And as we talk about free agency, I think something that very often flies in under the radar are that six teams in the NHL are playing in tax-free states or located in tax-free states. And that would be the Panthers, the Lightning, the Predators, the Stars, the Golden Knights, and the Kraken. And Neil, I'm going to start with you here. Uh, it's it often seems like it's it's somewhat of a multi tiered system because you've got six teams that basically have a different set of financial rules, and then you've got the clubs in Canada that they have to deal with the general sales tax, the provincial taxes. Is there any way to level the playing field in terms of taxation? You know, maybe. Do you give the Canadian teams more cap room because it's harder to attract teams there, even though uh, all the uh, teams and players, uh, everything is paid in American dollars? Uh, and is there a way to level the playing field for teams in non-tax states versus taxable states? Yeah, I, I, I didn't have too much of a problem with that in New York because New York – they have uh, man, a city tax, state tax, and federal tax. You've got to pay all three. And, you you, you know, you're over 50% when you live in Manhattan. But everybody wants to play at Madison Square. Well, not everybody, but a lot of ki- guys want to play at Madison Square Garden. Um, Florida, uh, that's a good attraction for them. But I don't think that a player is going to say, well, um, I think I can win in uh, a taxable state, but I, you know, and I'm not sure if, about this no tax state, so I'll go there. D- uh, don't forget too uh, that Alberta is a tax free, a s- provincial tax free state, and along a tax free province. Sorry, um, along with these uh, U.S. locations, I don't think they're going to have to even the playing field for them for this issue. I think that. It's tough for those Canadian teams to attract free agents. Um, 
I heard the other day that you'd be shocked if you knew how many players have all seven Canadian teams on their no trade list. So, you know, I don't think the league can do much. They knew what their franchise was and where it was located when they bought it. So I, I think that uh, they're just going to have to deal with it. Mike, your thoughts? I, I agree with Neil. I don't think the league should overreact when it comes to this. Um, players want to go places where they can win. The best players do anyway. Um, and I can tell you from experience, I, I worked in Nashville. I worked in Florida for years. And I, I sold the uh, no state income tax to agents and players all the time. Um, those teams... They're getting players now, but they're getting players now because they're successful organizations. They're well run. They're sure, they're nice places to live to, um, but they're winning. <laughs> um, if you go back 20 years or go back to the 90s, Neil, right? How many players wanted to sign in Tampa Bay when they were winning 15 games a year, right? Or Florida, uh, you know, when they didn't make the playoffs for 13 years. Um, Nashville, I was there during the expansion years. Guys were like, what the heck is this place? You know, I mean, it was uh, it wasn't easy to get players there. So just because these these organizations and these cities and towns have done a great job of building up their organizations now, and players want to play there, I think players want to play there because they can be successful there, not because they're going to save on state income tax. And so we shouldn't punish them for that. This is this is what we want teams to do, particularly expansion teams, um, and all of those teams that you mentioned are expansion teams uh, or were at one time. Um, I don't think we should punish them for, for asking them to do exactly what they did. And, and I, I, to add to that, Mike, before you go, I think too, that the teams that treat their players really well, which is most teams, um, uh, they are able to attract free agents too because word of mouth like the florida panthers from what i hear from everybody treats their players first class and you know sam sam reinhardt uh just stayed there when he could have god knows what he could have demanded on the free market but anyway mike your insights are fantastic as always uh, team 33 uh, we uh, wish you every bit of luck with that um i wish you and i could bump into each other on the on the road like we used to and be back in the nhl but at least we get to do this podcast together so thanks for coming on thanks for having me guys Macklin Celebrini was the first overall pick at the recent NHL draft in Vegas, going to the San Jose Sharks. And perhaps at some point downwind, he will be like Alex Barkoff and Connor McDavid playing in Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Final. Because Game 7 has a magic attached to it like nothing in sport. In order to prevail, teamwork is essential to achieving success. At the Game 7 group, Transforming individuals into cohesive teams is the core philosophy in their team-building approach. Their belief is every team has potential to achieve extraordinary results. Game 7 Group offers various services to help teams accomplish their goals through specific team-building events, coaching, and speaking engagements. These services are aimed at improving team dynamics, productivity, and overall performance. Face it. We all want to be able to succeed in the big moment. Check out the Game 7 Group website at game7group.com slash NHL Wraparound to learn more. Right now, a special incentive offer awaits our podcast listeners. Take your team to the next step. The Game 7 Group will get you there. And Neil, as clubs welcome their draftees, what are these players to expect as coming from either junior or college or from Europe and into the NHL as they start their summers and as they head towards their first training camps? Well, quite often uh, the teams will have development camps uh, almost uh, immediately after the draft and within a a week or so after the draft. And they'll bring uh, the young players in their organization into a uh, location and, and, you know, have on ice 
uh, evaluations and have off ice evaluations. And I would think at that time, that's when the players would get a nutritional program, uh, an exercise and uh, program uh, for cardiovascular and strength. Um, and I think they would just give them an indication of uh, what's to come and, and, and what the team expects out of them. And uh, when they come to training camp, if they come to training camp, because some will go back to college and not go to training camp. Um, when they get tested, um, you'll see some results uh, based upon how much hard work you did in the off season. What's the biggest single acclimation for a draft team? And obviously, a player like Celebrini and Connor Bedard a year before, you know, they get all the headlines. But let's face it, not all players drafted. It's very, very few of them uh, had that sort of generational talent. So for just the average draftee, what is the biggest acclamation for them? I think it's uh, going into adult life. Uh, you know, they've either been in junior in a billet, uh, probably with another player, maybe getting their meals cooked for them by a, a family. Um, and now all of a sudden, you know, you're in a hotel right at the beginning and you've got a huge amount of money given to you as your per diem to go out and you got to buy your own meals. And then once you, you know, make it to pro, you've got to start to cook your own meals and, uh, get around by yourself and realize that you got to buy toilet paper and Kleenex and <laughs> paper towels and all the rest of the ad adults knew how to buy. And, uh, you know, I think that's the biggest thing is, you know, yeah, you're making a lot of money, but you've also got to be an adult now. And, uh, with that comes adult things that aren't that much fun. Well, fast forward into 24, 25, Neil, thanks again, and thanks to Migray and the Game 7 group, and of course our special guest today, Mike Santos. Thanks to our listeners. Send questions and comments to NHLWrapAround at gmail.com and don't forget our website, NHLWrapAround.com. All of our episodes available both on audio and video platforms. And just a reminder, all summer we will continue to do shows and we'll be obviously focusing on the year ahead and we'll have opinions on all 32 teams well in advance of training camp so stay with us all summer long on nhl rapper thanks for joining us on the nhl wraparound podcast don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date on all the nhl action 